Ne. Good morning, everybody. Yes, somebody's been in a kindergarten classroom recently. I'll try that again. Good morning, everybody. Thank you. Um, I'm Sarah Rosenwortel, and I have the great privilege of being the president of the Urban Institute and to welcome all of you, uh, both in the room and online, uh, at today's discussion of um, the survival strategies of the poorest of the poor. First, I'm going to do a little bit of housekeeping and then just set up the conversation briefly. Um, uh, we do have an online uh, webcast going as we speak, and so if you're online, we hope you will join our conversation here in the room by submitting your questions for the panel to events at urban.org, and we will try to include them for the Q&A. We also include both people here in the room and those online to join the conversation online. Share your thoughts through social media using the hashtag live at urban. Today's conversation is particularly uh, uh, appropriate at, today, at this moment. Um, it was about 47 and a half years ago that the Urban Institute was founded um, uh, in part to help understand the conditions that had erupted in the riots in the cities in the mid-60s, as well as to help those who suddenly had launched a war on poverty to understand what did and didn't work of the strategies that have evolved over the 47 intervening years. Um, today, our institution works on a very wide array of different issues, from taxes to health care, nonprofits, work, earnings, lots of different issues, uh, all of which touch the poor, but also uh, touch many of us in our society. Um, and in each of these areas, we like to say, we try to bring um, uh, insight from research, facts, data, and um, experience with the lives of real people to the conversation, or elevate the debate. Today, we have an opportunity uh, to talk about people's lives um, and the struggles that they face in those lives in today's context. Mm -hmm. And frankly, it's going to be a tough conversation because some of these experiences that people in our own communities have are ones we really don't always want to think about. Um, the conversation is going to start with a really extraordinary discussion and really the reason we pulled this together today, the opportunity to have with us Kathy Eden and have her talk about her really extraordinary new book, Two Dollars a Day, Living on Almost Nothing in America, that she wrote with Luke Schaefer. Um, Kathy, I think as many of you probably already know, has um, had an extraordinary career in which she looks at and digs behind the research uh, by understanding the real lives of America's poorest uh, citizens. And um, together with some of the other experts here at Urban, um, and I'll let Marge introduce them and our uh, friends from DC, um, uh, who also have been working in communities, getting behind the numbers, uh, understanding the experiences of, of people in, uh, uh, in these communities, and then also trying to come up with new solutions and strategies. Um, we're going to have a really rich conversation um, uh, bringing all of those perspectives together. Um, uh, uh, let me just briefly introduce Marge and Shay one more word about Kathy, and then we'll get to the main highway. Um, so Marge Turner, who will be doing uh, the uh, moderating today, is the Senior Vice President of uh, a Policy Program and Management, but everyone else kind of knows her here as sort of the wisest woman at the Urban Institute. Um, we look to Marge for her expertise on issues of neighborhood, place, segregation, inequality, and mobility. Uh, Marge and I first met when she was the most uh, impressive person in, that I got to know when I was at the Department of Housing and Urban Development. She was Deputy Assistant Secretary for Research, um, and she was the most disciplined working mother I had ever met. Was completely prepared and on point at every meeting and uh, uh, exactly left the building when she said she would and got home and was there for her kids. And I was influenced by that model all my life, and I continue to be today. Um, uh, Marge uh, will introduce the rest of our colleagues on the panel. Um, our occasion for being here is 
uh, to uh, hear from Kathy to start. And those of you who probably already know, Kathy is the Bloomberg Distinguished Professor at John Hopkins. Um, and in addition to $2 a day, she is the author or co-author of three other books, which I highly recommend you find on Amazon, Making Ends Meet, How Single Mothers Survive Welfare and Low Wage Work, Doing the Best I Can, Fatherhood in the Inner City, and Promises I Can Keep, Why Poor Women Put Motherhood Before Marriage. Um, so uh, again, lots and lo and each of those represent years of, of work with uh, individuals. Um, um, for us at Urban, we're also really excited because Kathy has recently joined something called the U.S. Partnership on Mobility from Poverty, which is a very exciting effort funded by the Gates Foundation to bring together uh, 24 individuals from uh, completely different disciplines, domains, some who run direct interventions in the ground with models from community development to community health um, uh, and a lot in between with some of our country's um, uh, wisest researchers, people like Kathy, macroeconomists like Larry Katz, people who look at questions of structural racism and implicit bias, people who look at the criminal justice system and mass incarceration, experts on housing, experts on public health, and bring them all together to look at what can we do to accelerate the rate at which people can move up and out of poverty, and what solutions might um, uh, those who are able to invest, whether it's philanthropy, local government, or and what kind of policy environment we can create to make those solutions uh, accelerate, take off, and, and be more effective. Uh, Urban is very proud to be offering the uh, research support that will inform um, some of the work of the commission and to partner with others to bring it together. It's a very exciting initiative and uh, uh, um, I'm not allowed to say this, but when we sat down to um, make a list, I'm going to say it anyway for a webcast, make a list of um, who we wanted to have on uh, this uh, partnership. Um, I'm sure all 24 partners uh, came to mind exactly at the right time. I should say David Elwood is the chair. So when we sat down with David Elwood, um, the first name that everyone agreed needed to be there was Kathy Eden. So we feel privileged to be working with her on that, and we feel thrilled to have the chance to have her share a little bit with us about her most recent work. Please join me in welcoming Kathy Eden. Uh, just uh, one word before we get started. Um, I'm especially happy to be here uh, uh, on the panel with Susan Popkin, who is my big sister in graduate school. If you want to know more, catch me later. Good stories. Uh, I do want to start with the story because, uh, um, as many of you know, I am a storyteller. That's what uh, ethnographers do. Um, it was in 2010 uh, when I uh, first entered the home of a young woman named Ashley. Uh, uh, just off Madison Avenue in the Latrobe homes in Baltimore. Um, I was actually there supposed to be studying the transition to adulthood, but after a career of studying uh, welfare and welfare reform, uh, somehow the questions about making ends meet sneak in. Uh, when, I, when I arrived at Ashley's house, um, she had just given birth uh, two weeks before. Uh, she was visibly unkempt clearly depressed, so much so that, that she was actually having a hard time supporting her baby's head as uh, she rocked that child. Um, there was only uh, a few pieces of furniture in the household, a, a table with one broken leg that was kind of shoved, shoved against the wall in the kitchen alcove, and, and one chair. So, so Ashley and the baby sat in the chair, and I sat on the floor, which gave me a perfect view into the kitchen cabinets. And of course, there was nothing in the kitchen cabinet. Um, and as I began to query, I learned there was nothing in the refrigerator, and most wor worryingly, uh, no formula for the baby. So um, I kind of went into uh, making ends meet mode. My first book with Laura Lane was called Making Ends Meet, and it involved six years of me running around the country interviewing um, welfare recipients. This is just prior to welfare reform about their budget. So, I began asking Ashley about her budget and soon learned that she was living a cashless life uh, there in the Latrobe home. She was one of the many uh, public housing residents who are zero income. And a thought occurred to me. Um, I'd finished studying welfare in the mid-1990s, and I'd gone on to, to, to study the family, really. And, and I hadn't really been asking questions about people's economic lives. but. 
maybe I thought, um, you know, in the aftermath of welfare reform, uh, right, uh, you know, beneath our noses, uh, a new kind of poverty had arisen that was so deep. Uh, we, we had assumed it couldn't be uh, in America, and therefore we hadn't even looked. So I continued upon my uh, you know, study of the transition to adulthood with Baltimore Young Adults, went back to my office in Cambridge, Massachusetts, where I was teaching at the time at the Harvard Kennedy School. And uh, by luck, uh, Luke Schaefer was visiting, uh, a visiting um, professor there that fall. And as soon as he came to my office, I looked at him and I saw four large letters. They flashed in my mind, S-I-P-P. -P. Uh, Luke is one of the nation's uh, uh, experts on the one data set that could tell us whether the, what I had seen uh, with Ashley was, was, was a thing, was uh, true more generally for the American population. I knew enough about Luke and I knew enough about the data set uh, that the best thing possible had just arrived on my doorstep. So I told him uh, the story of Ashley. And do I have a clicker? Oh, wow. Okay, cool. So, um, lo and behold, a week later, he arrived back in the office with estimates that I think uh, even shocked uh, he and I. Um, we chose an arbitrary threshold, $2 a day, because, you know, we had to choose something, and it's always better to choose someone else's arbitrary threshold than your own. Uh, this is, of course, one of the thresholds used by the World Bank, and we found that the number of families with children reporting cash incomes of less than $2 a day had grown from about $600,000 in 1996 uh, to over $1.5 in 2011. And those numbers have not come down. They've held steady. So, of course, no respectable social scientist sticks with one data set, especially in the era of underreporting. So we wanted to look at as many different indicators as we could to see if this was a thing. Uh, these data are really stunning. They come from the food stamp program. And what we see here is that families on food stamps reporting zero income, by the way, this is upon penalty of a felony charge, right? It's a felony to lie about your income to food stamps. Uh, rose from about 300,000 in 1995 uh, to 1.2 million in 2013. Uh, finally, uh, schools began uh, reporting on children with no regular place to live in 2004. You see uh, there the Hurricane Katrina blip. Um, I was going to quiz you about that, but we don't have time to see if you could figure it out. And what we see is this, uh, other than the blip, really a monotonic rise in the number of children in U.S. households, uh, U.S. schools who are reporting homelessness. Finally, uh, we have reports from the nation's food banks. And again, we see that rise. Uh, there are more recent data. Uh, they're not perfectly comparable to the data here, so we don't include them in the time series, but they show uh, the number of unduplicated clients at food pantries actually rising considerably after 2009 as well. So this number story was fantastic, right? I I'd had Ashley's story, and now we had some confirmation that this was going on around the country. But in many ways, uh, this raised more questions than answers. And we decided we needed to go back uh, to the beginning, to more families like Ashley. Uh, could we go around the country to places that the SIP indicated uh, uh, we would find $2 a day poverty and actually find some folks and follow them. So uh, we did so, and we identified four research sites. Um, began in Chicago, perhaps America's, America's quintessential city. Uh, we moved on to Cleveland, Ohio, once a boom town in Michael Harrington's time, uh, now sometimes called a mistake by the lake. But having lived there for two summers, I love Cleveland. Uh, we then went to uh, uh, Appalachia, to a part of Appalachia that had seen some economic recovery, really, since the war on poverty, and then, of course, to what uh, many call the poorest place on earth, at least in America, the Mississippi Delta. And, and we really wanted to, to, to look at how folks ended up on $2 a day poverty, what they did to survive, and what, were the co what, what do we think the consequences might be. So this is part of this iterative mixed method approach that we took. So um, first, the causes. Uh, in, in my mind, what our research is suggesting 
is that the causes of $2 a day poverty are really a three-legged stool of the virtual death of welfare, or, or TANF, uh, since welfare reform, uh, the uh, degradation of low-wage work uh, that has occurred really uh, since uh, welfare reform in the last 15 years, and uh, the affordable housing crisis. Uh, but most profoundly is the story about TANF. Uh, if you know anything about the numbers, if you hang around with LaDonna Pavetti, as a lot of us like to do, uh, who knows more about this than any human being on the planet, uh, you'll know that uh, the TANF to poverty ratios, the number of poor households with children touched by, uh, by TANF, or AFDC, its predecessor, in the late 80s was about eight families in 10. At the eve of welfare reform, that number was seven families in 10. Now we're down to two families in 10. And in many mountain and southern states, the TANF to poverty ratios are in the single digits or the low teens. Uh, we found evidence of this all over the country. Uh, when Madonna Harris and her little daughter Brianna were going hungry on the weekends while living in a Chicago homeless shelter, a friend encouraged her to go to TANF. And she said, oh, haven't you heard? They just aren't giving that out anymore. No one in her extended circle had received TANF. Uh, when we asked uh, Travis Compton and his wife Jessica, who were really in desperate straits, both of them uh, had uh, service sector jobs. Their hours had been reduced uh, to zero when the foot traffic uh, slowed. They were three months behind on the rent. They were Travis, as we talked, was looking out the window, waiting for the bailiff to come uh, to evict them. And when I asked Travis why he just didn't go down and apply for TANF, he looked at me blankly and said, what's that? Finally, uh, Ray McCormick in Cleveland, we finally did talk her into going to the TANF office. Uh, she, she goes uh, to meet with a caseworker, uh, comes back out and says, you know, they told me, uh, honey, I'm sorry, there are just so many needy people, we don't have enough to go around. And, and there's evidence that these soft diversions are happening in significant numbers across the country. Uh, so when poor folks hit hard times, they no longer even think of TANF as an option in many places across our nation. So, sorry about that. I forgot that this slide was timed. <laughs> now, you might think that the $2 a day poor are a subgroup that's sort of disconnected from the American mainstream. Uh, they're deeply disconnected from work. They're sort of a dependent class who happen to be outside of, the, uh, outside of, of welfare. Uh, what we find here is that uh, if you look at children over the course of a year, 70% of $2 a day poor kids live in households um, where at least one adult was in the labor force, and only one in 10 had an adult who claimed even a penny from TANF. So the second leg of that stool is really folks uh, very much seeing themselves as workers, taking pride in being taxpayers, uh, talking about how important that identity is to them, but really hanging on to the ragged edge of a low-age labor market that's becoming more and more degraded. Now you might wonder, how people survive on $2 a day poverty. Here I'm going to give you just a taste because I want you to read the book. Uh, you can read the book in five hours if you're a pretty fast reader. Uh, actually, the audio book is quite good. Um, so, uh, you know, we found a, a number of strategies people were employing, but I, I want to emphasize these were really st strategies on the sort of the very bottom of the survival strategies hierarchy that I've spent my career uh, documenting. Uh, the two most common uh, were plasma sales and the sale of food stamps. Uh, we have evidence that SNAP fraud is actually rare in this country, but it is almost ubiquitous among the two already day poor because it turns out that in America's most capitalist nation, you actually need uh, cash to survive. And so this is really the only form of barter these families can engage in. And, and of course, at, at only 50 to 60 cents in the, on the dollar, uh, this guarantees that your family uh, will go hungry. I just wanted to show you the startling data on the rise of plasma sales in the United States since 2005 when we began collecting these data. Um, it's, it's, it's truly awesome. It's amazing. Uh, and we're, um, we're the, the OPEC of plasma sales. I just want to end with one short story about a family in the Mississippi Delta 
that has uh, experienced two dollar a day poverty uh, for many many years uh, the mom Alva Mae Hicks sells her food stamps uh, to pay the heating bills uh, the children often go hungry two and a half weeks of the month uh, they live the rest of the time on a diet of ramen noodles which is not good for kids brains and when we asked Tabitha uh, her 18 year old daughter who's featured in the last chapter of the book what it was like to be that hungry uh, she said well actually it feel like you want to be dead because it's peaceful being dead so I'll end with that People who don't have chairs, please um, come take ours. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and uh, more chairs are coming. Uh, I'm Marjorie Turner, um, uh, and I'm uh, so delighted to have Kathy here today uh, to talk about this book and its uh, implications with a terrific group of other uh, experts. Um, I'm, I'm still um, sort of shaken by that final quote. Um, it's really really distressing, and I know everyone on this panel uh, uh, has uh, research experience and personal experience uh, with that kind of suffering and distress. Um, and so as Sarah said when we started, uh, it's likely to be disturbing today to talk about the um, severe pover poverty that exists among us, but is so often invisible to us. Uh, and, uh, but I hope we can also be thinking about solutions uh, as well as kind of facing up to the issues. So um, I'm going to uh, briefly introduce our panel. Uh, Greg Ott uh, is the director of the Urban Institute's Income and Benefits Policy Center. Uh, and his work uh, focuses on social insurance, social welfare, uh, and uh, the compensation of workers. So the issue both of uh, the fraying safety net and the uh, really tough bottom of the labor market in today's economy. Adrian Todman uh, is the executive director of the District of Columbia's uh, Public Housing Agency. Uh, she served there since 2009. And the DC Housing Authority uh, serves over 50,000 uh, residents today. And it's the largest provider of affordable housing in our, in our city. Uh, and Sue Popkin. Uh, is a senior fellow here at the Urban Institute. Uh, she directs our Neighborhoods and Youth Development Initiative. And for as long as I have known Sue, uh, she ha too has been applying these mixed methods and really reaching in uh, to poor communities and meeting and learning from uh, the people facing the toughest circumstances. Uh, there's more biographical information about all these people in your folders. So we're going to get started with with a first round of um, questions that's going to let everybody uh, say a little bit about uh, what they know and how they're thinking about these issues, um, starting with Greg. Um, so um, this, is, uh, this year is 20 years since we ended welfare as we knew it. Uh, and I, I think it would be great if you could say a little more about how our safety net programs have evolved over those two decades. Thank you, Marge. Thank you, Kathy, for sharing your work with us. And thank you all for coming. Uh, I'd like to uh, talk a little bit about the, our, the way the safety net has changed over the last 20 years. And essentially, in welfare, during the welfare reform era in the 90s, we saw a shift from cash assistance to in-kind assistance and with an emphasis on the best kind of welfare reform is to make work pay. So I'm going to talk about three components of the safety net. TANF, mm -hmm. the SNAP program, or food stamps, and the earned income tax credit. Starting with TANF as um, Kathy indicated welfare is dead. Um, I think it's more really, really tired. Uh, but essentially, TANF, back in 1996, there were 5.6 million families that had income low enough to be eligible for AFDC. That's even below the poverty line uh, in many states. 
out of those 5.6 million that were eligible, 80% of the families who were eligible were participating. By 2012, you still had about 5.6, 5.7 million people eligible for TANF, even though the standards had changed and there were more requirements. But out of that 5.7 million that were eligible, one-third were participating. So in addition to TANF not reaching the people who are eligible for the assistance, the amount of assistance that they got declined. The real value of TANF benefits for um, a recipient uh, declined by about 20% over that 16-year period. Now, how much do we spend on TANF? The federal government spends almost $15 billion on TANF. States supplement it with about another $15 billion. So it's about $30 billion total. Where does this money go? Well, only 30% of that $30 billion are going in direct cash aid to these low income, these really poor families. Another 20% is going to work supports, child care transportation assistance, noble but not cash. Uh, about 10% goes to administration system support. 40% goes to other purposes. Now these are things like child welfare, um, but it's not direct cash assistance to the low income families. The TANF program has fundamentally changed. It is a very different safety net than we had before. The SNAP program, food stamps, in-kind assistance, vouchers to buy food, or electronic benefit cards to buy food these days, um, has grown. Back in 96, you had about 15 million fa uh, families who were eligible for SNAP benefits, about two-thirds of whom participated. By 2012, the uh, number of families eligible grew to 23.2 million, and the take-up rate um, was like seven-eighths. So seven-eighths of families who were eligible for food stamps uh, were getting it. The real value of food stamp benefits also increased from about $110 per recipient to about $130 per recipient. The third component of the safety net that I want to talk about today is the earned income tax credit. And that is geared, you only get it if you can work. Um, it's worth up to $5,400, over $5,400 if you're making about 18,000, 17,000, 18,000 a year, which is about full time on minimum wage. The real value of this benefit went from about 40 billion to 60 billion in terms of spending on it. Uh, and the families it reached increased from under 20 million to over 28 million. So this work component of the safety net did increase considerably. What does this mean for deep poverty? Using the official poverty line, not the $2 a day threshold and cutting it by half. So deep poverty is 50% of the poverty line. Well, it was 5.4% in 96. It hit 6.7% during the recession. It's come down to 6.3% today. So deep poverty is somewhat higher today than it was before. One of the issues is we're not counting things like earned income tax credit and SNAP benefits, and we can talk about that later in the Q&A. Thank you. Thanks, Greg. Thanks. So Adrian, um, uh, Kathy identified um, high housing costs as part of the three-legged stool, and certainly being a provider of affordable housing mm -hmm. addresses that challenge for, for a segment mm -hmm. of those in need. But you've also talked about the way in which um, affordable housing can be a platform for delivering other needed services, especially to the most vulnerable households. And um, I thought you could talk a little bit about here in DC, sure. uh, who receives um, housing assistance, and what kinds of needs do they have, and, and how are you leveraging the affordable housing stock to meet those thank needs? Thank you. Thank you for that. And, and I read the book in three hours, so oh, it's, very it's, <laughs> it's very <laughs> possible. <laughs> it's, very, it's very possible. Well done. Um, so housing authorities, we are affordable housing providers. That's what we do. But for anybody who's been in this business more than two or three years, you realize that housing is just not enough. So we have over 50,000 individuals that we house here in DC. About 12, 15,000 of our head of households are female, and 5,000 are male. And surprisingly, maybe surprisingly to you, most of our families have some form of working income, of working income. We have, while we have 3,500 individuals who are on TANF, we have over 5,400 who actually earn an income through work. 
So we are talking about families who are actually the working poor. And when you find someone who is in public housing or the voucher program, we administer both. When I am out at the sites or speaking to our families, um, when particularly the young men who come up to me are interested in working. The, the, the theory that somehow I'm in housing, it's good, I'm just going to let the government take care of me for the rest of my life is just wrong. Um, families want to live with integrity. Families want to live to make sure that their children are doing better than they are. And housing is a platform through which they're able to live in a stable environment, but it's just not enough. Um, it, 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 it tires me sometimes when so many of our young folks are, are, are thriving to find good jobs, but are challenged by some of the underlying issues of their circumstances. So as a housing provider, we realize that we have to do more by way of service division. So we provide workforce training um, in our Southwest Center, where families come in to learn just how to use a computer, including our seniors. We have some seniors who are now using Facebook as a way to connect with each other. And so it's, there's, a, there's, there's value along the age range. But we're also working very carefully with our contractors, because for us, there has to be a retail value to our work. So it's when you have someone and you've put them on that platform to learn how to use a computer, how to, how to have work ethics that are valued in the workplace these days, you then need to find a job. And if you live in DC, you will know if you go to the Washington Post to find uh, job listings, there's not a lot of jobs for the families that we serve. So we take it upon ourselves to help create those jobs. And create, we create those jobs either through using our contracts with our contractors, and either you are going to do an apprenticeship, either you're going to train someone on how to do the work that you do, or we do something creative where we use tools like the New Market Tax Credit Program, which when we deploy our funding to those sites, we say, what are you going to do for our families? And so just in the past year, we've created 500 jobs for our clients of Public Housing the Voucher Program by being smart about how we do our business. So it's very possible to find ways to link housing and what we do with, with making sure that we're able to provide other services, other retail um, availability for our families. And so I value the fact that Kathy mentioned that we need to have a system that really is based on American values if we're going to be successful. When people think about welfare, they think about a certain image. And that image is not necessarily correct. So we do need to have, as we move away from the war on poverty, I think we need to now have an accord on opportunity. We need to think about ways to actually leverage what we believe is important to us as Americans in ways to help other Americans who are not as lucky as we are. Hmm. Thanks, Adrian. <coughs> so Sue, um, one of your big interests in recent years has been how poverty and particularly living in um, neighborhoods of concentrated poverty and distress plays out in the lives of girls and mm -hmm. young women. Uh, and I thought you could talk a little bit about those issues, but also uh, the coping strategies. Uh, mm -hmm. Kathy in introduced the idea of coping strategies in these desperate situations. And um, you've been encountering that with these young women. We s I have for a long time, and I think I would agree that things are getting worse. And I know it's an interest and a concern that Adrian shares. And uh, we've been working uh, specifically on girls' issues in DCHA developments. But my interest in girls and gender-specific effects grows out of my many, many years, I've been thinking since I finished the draft of my book, of research in public housing communities, which are concentra concentrated poor, racially segregated, uh, chronically violent for the most part, especially back in the 80s and 90s, when things were even worse than they are now. And I heard many stories from women who lived there about their experiences of harassment, domestic violence, and rape and also how they felt like they just had to accept that that's the way it is, nothing's going to get better, and that they had nobody to talk to about it. Uh, then I got involved with the Moving to Opportunity demonstration, which helped people move out of public housing to lower poverty areas. One of the earliest effects of MTO was that the women and girls' health, mental health improved when they moved, and their physical health. Mm -hmm. And I remember sitting there in a meeting full of uh, mostly economists at HUD, <laughs> and. Uh, all the men in the room were really upset about the fact that the boys were not doing better and this was a failure. And I said, wait a minute, we have really good news. The girls are doing better. And they got away. And we, I was able to get some funding with some colleagues and do some qualitative follow-up. And indeed, it's exactly what women and girls will tell you about what's different about living in low poverty, that they feel like they can go outside, 
that they don't get harassed when they go to the bus stop, that they don't get hassled at school. It really makes a huge difference in their lives. And because of that, uh, with Greg and with others, we developed a concept of a measure, a neighborhood effect that we thought we could measure that goes along with collective efficacy that we're calling a coercive sexual environment. And uh, when you have it, 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 it mm. we think it emerges in neighborhoods of chronic poverty, chronic disadvantage, and chronic violence. And when you have that situation, women and girls become especially vulnerable to exploitation and harassment. Um, and the, the mothers in those communities, it's not that the adults in the communities like it or looking the other way or pretending it's not happening, it's that they don't know what to do. They don't feel empowered to stop it. It may have happened to them, probably did. Um, and they, they re literally feel helpless, they will tell you that. Um, and you saw it in Kathy's book. <laughs> mm -hmm. if you, the extreme poverty, the desperation, the instability make girls and women vulnerable to exploitation. Um, and the shrinking safety net, and the unstable job market, all the things you documented so uh, well have really forced kids into very adult roles. Uh, they are helping their parents cope in lots of ways. They are going hungry. They are eating ramen noodles. They are going hungry so their younger siblings can eat. They are um, doing hustling, anything they can think of to get a little extra money. And sometimes, just like homeless, you hear about it, homeless women and teens, and we're hearing it in state from stably housed kids. Mm -hmm. and they are trading sex for food. They are dating older men. They are getting people to pay their rent. Um, and it is out of desperation. And I think it's, those are really sensitive issues, and nobody likes talking about it. And I think we have to talk about it sensitively. It's really important. It is happening. Mm -hmm. And we heard it in the work that we were, we've heard heard it in the work we're doing in DCHA communities around sexual health and safety. It is a real crisis and I think we ignore it to our peril. Our kids are not going to be able to move up and have upward mobility if they are traumatized. Thanks. Um, so Kathy, uh, one of the things that makes your research so compelling is that you have met with and talked with and lived with uh, uh, the people that you are telling us about mm -hmm. uh, and bringing their voices and their stories into the conversation. So I, I think we've had some hints at it, but I wanted to give you a chance to say more explicitly, what, what would the people living on $2 a day uh, offer as we shift to the what do you do about it part of this conversation? What are their views on what they need, what they want, um, how our labor market and policy environment um, could change? So we uh, identified 18 families across these four sites who were living under this threshold for at least three months. And then we followed them each for several years. And I have to say, I've been doing this work a long time. And this sort of knocked the wind out of my sails. It was the most, most difficult work uh, I've ever done, in part because of some of the, uh, the sexual exploitation mm -hmm. uh, that, that the multiple precarious double-ups uh, that, that were ubiquitous among families who did not have uh, a voucher or a public housing unit uh, were facing. So I uh, just wanted to start with that. Well, what's really fascinating about this research was the emphasis people placed on their identities as workers. Uh, when I was studying welfare reform, uh, welfare prior to welfare reform, most mothers really saw a trade-off. It wasn't that they didn't want to work, but they were really worried about the effect on their kids. So, uh, and they were especially worried back in, back in those days about losing uh, their health insurance. Uh, so as they contemplated what was then a choice between welfare and work, the job had to be pretty good for them to uh, agree to leave their kids um, for many hours of the day, uh, you know, um, engage in long commutes, um, and uh, you know they had to make sure they could support their kids at least to the same level they had while they were on on welfare. Um, but that dialogue has really changed. If you talk to single mothers now, they'll say, "Well, um, I can't be a good parent unless I'm working because I can't model the value of education to my children." Just an astonishing sea change in how people really see the job of a parent. And, and this is really evident in this work. These, these families saw themselves as workers. Part of the reason they don't come to welfare's door is they're, uh, they're loath to relinquish that status. And to apply for TANF is, uh, even if you know about it, is like a social death. It's like 
giving up your citizenship card. It's like taking on a, a label of dependence that they very much uh, revile. So if you ask people what we ought to do about this program, you know, I personally believe we need to restore TANF to its original purpose, which is as an income support and as a springboard to work. And it is doing neither of those things. Uh, but uh, the families won't tell you that. They'll say, uh, what I want more than anything else is a job. Mm -hmm. And so what we advocate for in two dollars a day is radically expanding work opportunity. I think there is a lot of evidence, right, that uh, the welfare reform bill was called PRORA, Personal Responsibility and Work Opportunity Reconciliation Act. Say that really fast three times, you'll, you'll be sure to get it mixed up. But personal responsibility is something that these people have heard loud and clear. They are doing this. Mm -hmm. They are working when mm -hmm. possible. They're even uh, working at incredibly low quality jobs. Jennifer Hernandez in the book has this, this, uh, this cleaning job. You know, she's going to get kicked out of the shelter if she doesn't get a job. A lot of shelters have work requirements um, for you to move on to the next phase. And she gets a job the day before she's going to get evicted with a cleaning company. She ends up uh, in, in, a, in, in a job that involves cleaning foreclosed homes in Chicago in the winter. Of course, foreclosed homes have no heat, no lights, no water, and so on. And she ends up getting, she's a severe as, asthmatic. She ends up getting very, very sick. Uh, but, but even in those circumstances, Jennifer still sees herself as a worker. So I think we need to, to really think about uh, how, to, how to expand work opportunity in ways uh, that, bring, that bring dignity and, uh, and, and hope to families who really want to play by the rules, but, but you know, we haven't delivered in providing that work opportunity. So in many ways, that connects um, to Greg's expertise in how the labor market is changing over the same period um, that our, um, our safety net system has changed. So can you uh, a amplify a bit on um, uh, if people want to work, uh, mm -hmm. and the evidence suggests that they are working, uh, how can we be in a circumstance where uh, we still have this rising number of people uh, really living at unsustainable uh, level. So it's frequently said that the best anti-poverty uh, device is a job. But I think we really have to look at what the jobs, these entry-level, low-paying jobs are like and whether they're really stepping stones. So if you uh, look at a lot of jobs in the low-wage labor market that women with, say, less than a high school education can have. You may have a job, but you don't have regular hours. So one week you could be working 40, one week you could be working four. You may not have a regular schedule where, you know, you work the breakfast shift on one day and the next day you're working the happy hour or the post-happy hour shift. Uh, and it's very hard to keep your life organized when your work is so unstable. Layer on top of it that these jobs probably don't offer much flexibility in terms of things like paid time off if you have to take care of a sick kid or attend to any other family issues. Um, and these jobs inherently are unstable. So while your typical, on average, uh, woman with less than a four-year high school degree earns about 375 a week, and that translates into about 18000 a year. If you're working full time, full year, mm. you're not in these jobs. You're losing a job, you're going from job to job, and that instability is what's contributing to the poverty for families who really do want to work. They just can't work regularly. And so what I worry about is that these jobs that are supposed to be stepping stone jobs out of poverty, because of the nature of work, uh, those are really very slippery rocks indeed. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Additions to the work point? Yeah, I, I, I think that sometimes we need to even start before our you know, families we work with are work eligible. Um, you know, one of the things I'm focused on here in DC is how do we begin to work with our children, our youth, um, to prepare them in many different ways, not just to imagine a world outside of their community, you, you'll be amazed how many of our families um, have never been to the Smithsonian, mm -hmm. my, our kids, never been to the Capitol Dome, you know, never walked the grounds of the mall. Um, things that inspire you mm -hmm. um, to sort of do better, be better. 
And so, so we're very focused also in looking at using housing as a platform. How do we get to our babies so they can imagine and dream of a reality outside of the one that they see around them? And when you think about housing authorities, I have 5,000 youth. The, the, the collective impact of all housing authorities being supported in such a way that all of the children we house, which I think is over a million, imagine what that would do to help in bring down our poverty rate if we're able to lift all of those children out of poverty so they don't continue the cycle. So, so the work that we do, the research that we have, you know, show that, that yes, we want to be able to make sure that our adults are in a job, but I think the challenge to all of us as grown-ups is what do we do for the, the youth who are right behind them? I think, at, in fact, the numbers are even bigger than you cite because um, there are families flowing through exactly. your units over exactly. time. Exactly. Um, there are a lot of folks who live in our units, a lot of men um, who live in our units who we don't have um, um, any, any documents on. And so, you know, you may turn a blind eye because you know this is someone is stable to have a, a man in the household. But you're right, there are a lot of families who will use our affordable housing as a place to rest their head um, as they're trying to go to that next step. Mm -hmm. So Sue, we've heard a lot um, about health, both as a contributor uh, to some of the instability mm -hmm. and as a consequence of instability and extremely low incomes. And um, maybe you could say a little bit more about the health effects of this kind of desperately low uh, income level. I think Kathy gave an excellent illustration of just how bad this is. Uh, but uh, for many years of following people living in extreme poverty, we've seen the evidence of trauma. We now know that trauma and exposure to violence has physical effects on the body that last, that may get handed down in genetic, uh, in genetic anomalies that are handed on to kids. Uh, we don't know, but they can, doctors can see the effect on people's chromosomes from the living with chronic stress. Uh, we see extremely high rates of depression and other mental health problems and the kind of depression that you described where people cannot get out of bed, can't even hold their baby, can't do anything. Um, not the kind that you can function through life. <laughs> um, and then chronic health conditions. I'm doing research for Adrian right now on the health conditions of the families and every time I do a survey in public housing we see sky high rates of asthma, uh, which is the most common chronic disease for children. We see diabetes, we see hypertension, um, we see, and when, I think one of the things that's really different, it's not that we don't have an obesity epidemic across the whole country, we do. But when you see the uh, health effects of people who are living in these kinds of communities, they're not just, they don't just have a condition, it is disabling them. They, may, they are so sick with their asthma, they can't walk up a flight of stairs. They have arthritis so bad they can't lift something. I mean, it is really a level that most of us don't even have to think about. Um, so, and I think when you think about the kids, the effect of all of that has on the kids and their ability to perform in school and their ability to get to school at all if they've got chronic health conditions or their mom has a chronic health condition and can't get them to school. Um, and we, it's not that we don't have health care in DC. I think, if I, in fact, I do know from doing the uh, survey we just did, everybody has health coverage, but somehow it is not treating the uh, community or the situation around them. Yep. Can I jump in on that? Absolutely. I just want to say uh, something that we noticed about health. You know, in the Delta, um, the schools give away trophies for, like, anything. So, <laughs> you know, like, showing up. The kids know that, by the way. It doesn't work. Uh, but many homes have these, these tables full of these trophies. Uh, over time, we, we realized that there was a different kind of tro trophy table in the bedroom, and that is all of the medications on the bedside table. Mm -hmm. uh, Martha Johnson, last time I was at her house, um, actually had a, had a medicine suitcase because she was on so many different medications. And so we do, we do see this richly illustrated in our data, both as a cause and a consequence of extreme poverty. One conclusion we did come to, or at least a hypothesis that we derived from our work, is that uh, often we, th we used to think, gosh, you have to get rid of the barriers and then you can get people to work. Uh, but what our families were telling us is that work had a real therapeutic power. Mm -hmm. uh, they often described work as uh, the best part of the day, uh, where they could put their demons at bay. They loved the structure. They loved uh, the sense that they were making a contribution. Mm -hmm. You know, it's just such d sort of deeply American things. And so um, what, one thing that Luke Schaefer and I will be trying to test in the state of Michigan 
is whether improving the quality uh, of jobs uh, for, uh, for unskilled individuals can actually improve their, their health. Um, we're going to open the conversation up to all of you in just a couple of minutes. But before we do, I want to see if we can put some uh, policy remedies on the table, uh, starting with uh, ideas for the federal government, but also focusing on uh, strategies states and localities can and should be pursuing. So, so I think starting with uh, the federal, let's hear what everybody has to say. But Kathy, uh, do you think um, there are any welfare reforms that um, Democrats and Republicans <laughs> might agree upon, if not today, in the foreseeable future? Well, you know, I don't think it's been well known how uh, TANF has really been converted in many cases to uh, a, a, a mechanism to, pu to plug state budget holes, as, as Greg said. And I think most of you know, if you, if you poll Americans, they'll say uh, they don't want more welfare, but they also say that they think the poor need more support. So um, there's a lot of compassion for the poor among uh, the electorate and among our elected officials. Uh, I, I personally think that we need to hold states, in, you know, I'm, I'm repeating actual items in the president's budget here, um, we need to hold states accountable and create positive incentives for them to convert more of those dollars to assistance for the poor. Uh, I think some emergency aid uh, should be restored that, uh, one thing we document in the book is a lot of sort of downward spirals into extreme poverty based on a single event. Ray McCormick, two-time cashier of the month at Walmart, you know, her, her tank turns up empty one day and, and she's, she's fired. What if she had a, a fund to go to that could have filled that gas tank and she could have kept that spiral from going down? Uh, so uh, I do think there are things to do with, with the current TANF system that will restore it to its original purpose. And remember, this was a, you know, a, sort of a bipartisan effort um, to create a temporary safety net and a springboard to work. Only 8%, I believe, of current block grant dollars are going uh, to work activities in states. Uh, that percentage should be much, much higher. This, the, the sort of emergency aid uh, is one some of us have talked about in a housing context mm -hmm. as well, mm -hmm. that, uh, that sometimes a, the inability to pay the rent this month or pay the full rent this month uh, kicks somebody into a cycle of eviction, yep. doubling up, homelessness, mm -hmm. uh, and in fact the costs then of helping are much, much higher That's and, right. and um, our subsidy shortages come into play. Other um, so federal ideas yeah. first? I mean, mine is easy. Um, I think we, we need to have better funding at the federal level for affordable housing. I mean, this is a no-brainer. If, if you think about you know, the core things that we need as people, um, we need to eat, we need to breathe <laughs> well, um, housing is right up there. And if you, if you don't have someplace stable to live, I can imagine what it would be like to try to deal with other, other parts of your life. And, 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 I said and stay employed. And stay, in, and stay employed. But, but also, I, I, I believe that one of the things that we need to do is we need to meet families where they're at. Not that we, do not, we no longer need a cookie-cutter approach to programming. Some moms may just need childcare. That's all they need. Mm -hmm. you know, some men may just need the transportation. So I think we need to be much more individualized and much more sensitive that people are not machines. They're people, and we need to think about our programming that way. Are there federal policy ideas to put on the table? Well, I would echo Any what discussion? Adrian just said, um, and actually even more, I would say, restore the funding to the public that you can have your housing be decent and safe. Absolutely. Because uh, there were huge strides making, made in making our public housing better over the 90s, and, to, and now I see your notice every time you send it out about how little capital funding you have, and it's real. It went down. It should go up. It should go up, yes, <laughs> because it, we're, people are depending on it. And then I think one for your side, uh, we should also be helping people who want to move to places that offer more opportunity to go. And so that's right out of the president's budget, too. Indeed. <laughs> so I think we don't want to lose the idea that we want the folks to be working and the right. value of work. And so you know, the idea, when you, think, you talk to economists about work, you talk about well, what, how much um, do you have if you don't work? or the welfare option and how much you get if you work. And so we try to make work pay. 
the other way you make work pay more than welfare is to make welfare pay less. But if welfare pays too much less, mm -hmm. then you find families engaging in such desperate measures that it makes it hard for them even to start working when the opportunity arises. That's right. So our TANF block grant has not been adjusted for inflation in 20 years. If we're spending about, the block grant's about $15 billion, with ad state in, it's about $30 billion. If we were to adjust it for 20 years worth of inflation, that would be about a 50% increase. So about $15 billion more. Uh, and if we spent that on actual cash benefits and not all the other stuff, right. we could build up the floor. Then, of course, what we need to do is to make work pay even more than that restored floor, which means we have to put renewed effort into the earned income tax credit to make work pay, uh, so to make work continue to pay more. So those are two things. Thanks. So I want to um, go quickly to the um, whole conversation, but Adrian, I want to give you a chance to put one uh, uh, dramatic uh, state and local idea on the table. Oh, wow. A new state <laughs> and local idea. So um, I think that we should look at really working with our men. Um, um, I, a lot of times we are so focused on our, our moms, and I'm a mom, I get the moms, um, and we're so focused on our youth. I think sometimes we, we look at the, the men in our population and think, you're a man, work it out. Um, I think that we need to realize that it takes the whole family. Mm -hmm. um, it takes the whole family um, to make the ship run safely. And, so, and, and a lot of times we forget that, that men are part of that, that ship. And so it might seem strange and uh, not uh, for a female to say that, but I think that um, if we want to look at really lifting um, our families out of poverty, we need to be very sensitive to the fact that we need to double down on the work we're doing with, with our men. Thanks. I think that, that resonates with Kathy. Yeah. There is another book uh, <laughs> by Kathy oh. Eden <laughs> on that topic. <laughs> And I didn't know that, so yeah. there you go. Uh, so let's open it up uh, to everybody's questions and comments. I think a microphone will come around. Um, and if you would stand up and say who you are, uh, that would be terrific. Thank you. Uh, I'm David Falk, University of Maryland. Um, nobody's mentioned drug addiction. Uh, I um, had to hear last week from two men from the Baltimore City Health Department Drug addiction among the poor is desperate. It's rising up the, ho uh, the homicide rate. There seems to be no solution. So if you read uh, the book I wrote with Tim Nelson on fathers, Doing the Best I Can, uh, addiction is a, light, a not so light motif that runs throughout that mm -hmm. whole book. It's a, it's a huge problem, so I can see that. I will say um, that among families with uh, dependent children living in the home, you don't see so much of that. We occasionally do. It's really hard to keep custody of your kids if you're in that situation. Uh, but if we think of the family holistically, as we've been encouraged to do, thank you so much. Um, we've got to realize the role that addiction is playing mm -hmm. in the family, even if the addicted member of the family doesn't happen to be living in the home um, some or all of the time. And it goes along with the uh, trauma and the mental health problems. And it does have a huge effect on families. I've interviewed a number of families where the mother isn't there anymore. Because, you know, the kids are living with the grandparents because the mother had an addiction problem. And she's on the street somewhere or, or dead. And I th so, yes, it's a huge problem. Yeah, my, my issue with drugs is, yes, addiction. But I think that you know, we, can treat the, we can treat addiction. My problem with drugs is that it has become an economy for so many of our families who can't find work anyplace else. And that actually is the largest impact on, on public housing, even yeah. more so, is folks have gone into um, a, a, a subculture of work. Um, which is which is the drug trade and and selling drugs and I found that has been more disturbing to our families even more than addiction. Mm -hmm. are you, you guys are managing. Okay, great. Thanks. Um, there was some discussion of uh, greatly expanding job opportunities for low-income residents. Can you talk a little bit more about maybe what that would look like and what type of jobs you're talking about? So there was a, a, a program actually during the recession, a uh, subsidized job program um, that uh, actually uh, used TANF dollars to offer incentives to employers to, uh, to hire folks. It was, it was adopted uh, by a, a large minority of the states. Uh, it, was, it was very popular among both employers and politically. 
uh, and there's evidence that it actually uh, created new jobs that lasted uh, beyond the time of the subsidy. And so we strongly, uh, we strongly encourage uh, a, program, a program that like that to be restored and expanded. Uh, but there is a pretty big problem here, and there's nothing better to motivate an employer to do the right thing than a tight labor market. So uh, we also encourage uh, rethinking of the role of government as, as employer. There's certainly much, much work to be done in our community, uh, infrastructure, education, parks and recreation. Uh, we have urgent needs in all of these domains. And so uh, we, in some ways, we're focusing on, on middle skill jobs. Uh, in our proposals because we believe that will tighten the labor market in ways that will provide opportunities across the board. But, but certainly um, the problem is large and we don't want, you know, in the, in the mobility partnership that, that um, I'm a part of, you know, we're all about big bets and we recognize that it will involve big bets to restore mobility in this country. So I think we may need to make a big bet on work and not a small piecemeal bet. And, and I'd like to add to that. So locally, we have a program that's called Project Empowerment, where um, the jobs are um, government subsidized. So we, you, you're basically taking a chance on an employee, but not so much because the government is paying a portion of all of their of their salary. And so that creates to a job uh, uh, employment. It creates to having a record of a job. You can build your resume. And and oddly enough, public housing was built as a work program. Uh, back yeah. in the 30s. So I think that we should you know, go back to the thoughts of those days and maybe help fix our roads and public housing as a jobs program for, the f for, for now. Okay. Yikes. Hi, I'm Joanne Guthrie, Economic Research Service. Reading um, Dr. Eden's book, um, one of the things that really came out so shocking was like the pervasive danger children's lives were in because of these uncertain, unstable situations, particularly instability in housing created huge danger for these very vulnerable children. And the tension between work and caretaking, especially when work's hours are not structured, not regular, your ability to make care plans is not good. As you think about, and I was, I was also struck by the emphasis on work in spite of it all. But it seems like there's a trade-off. More work, perhaps a safer home. But on the other hand, uh, what about these vulnerable children in care? And, and really, the adverse childhood experiences these children suffered were shocking, I think. Mm -hmm. Really shocking, yeah. You know, I think that's right. One thing that we noticed in our work on, on the Moving to Opportunity experiment is the number of kids who were unsupervised because mom was, mom was working two jobs. So uh, that's, that there, you know, 35 hours is one thing, uh, but two unstable jobs is a disaster uh, for parenting, especially if you're, if you're a single parent. Um, I do think that the kids that we followed need a lot of parenting. They've really been traumatized. Um, and you know, all of us as middle class folks uh, need jobs with give. And one of, Greg has spoken so eloquently about the problems in the low wage labor market. Another element is that these jobs more and more are kind of faceless jobs, right? Uh, they're jobs that don't offer any give. So when you have these very vulnerable children, you know, um, you know, Cole is now in a psychiatric facility, um, you know, and Jennifer Hernandez has to man manage that situation, and Caitlin is distressed and having asthma attacks and so on. So, so how do you think about work in that context? And, and we do, I think, need to think about ways that the conditions of work that we all rely on have disappeared in the low-wage labor market. And, and how can we encourage uh, employers to treat their employees like people and not cogs in a machine? So I don't have the answer for that problem, but I commend you for, mm -hmm. for raising that point. So I think at the moment we don't have questions coming online, so I just wanted to remind the people who are watching online it's events at urban.org. Okay. Uh, let's, should we go over here? 
And um, if you can say who you are, that would be terrific. Good morning. My name is Cody Kornack. I'm from National Head Start Association. Um, so in this conversation, as we talk about the desperate need for education and opportunities for the children, but also these comprehensive two-generation services for the parents, the fatherhood, the health, all of these things. I'm wondering where you see Head Start fitting into the equation. Yeah. I mean, I, I was in Head Start when I was uh, three years old. Um, I think I turned out pretty well. Um, <laughs> I think that, uh, you know, and I think, I, I, think, I think part of it is, you know, uh, fortunately here in D.C. we have universal pre-K, so that's great, but, but D.C. is a very progressive town. We don't have that, that all over the country. But I think there's, there's a lot of value to programs like, like Head Start, and that, that shouldn't be undervalued because there might be some folks who don't think they like it. I think that um, starting early with our youth is a, mm -hmm. is a good thing. Uh, one other paper I'd point you to is, is a paper by David Deming that looks at the long-range impacts of Head Start. Fantastic paper. He's at the Ed School at Harvard and shows that uh, in early adulthood there are all these gains mm -hmm. uh, in terms of criminal behavior and job getting, uh, wages, um, as a result of, of attending Head Start. So, you know, we, we have so much of, of what impacts these families is under our control because we have uh, access to these children as they attend our Head Start centers in our schools and we need to deploy mm -hmm. uh, that lever in much more effective ways Absolutely. than we are now. Mm -hmm. I, I would also just point out that uh, I think that research and also the latest uh, research uh, from Raj Chetty about the Moving to mm -hmm. Opportunity demonstration reminds us that often the big payoffs from these interventions yeah. take a decade or more right. to be realized in the lives of individuals. Mm -hmm. yeah. And that um, our tendency to look for the payoffs immediately, or even when we're pretty patient, like the moving to opportunity demonstration right. was a decade, uh, we, we miss the fact that uh, getting it right doesn't create an instantaneous transformation in the mm -hmm. lives of people who have been struggling for a long time. And in things that we can measure. Absolutely. So we have yeah. this path yeah. idea that it, you know, you should get, if you help at age five, you should see it at age eight and age 12. And then we see the effects fading out and said, well, it didn't work. But it did because it Something shows up in things yeah. that we aren't measuring. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. That's yeah. important. Yeah, it is. So, uh, I'm um, Linda Kaufman from Community Solutions. Um, you haven't specifically talked about homelessness, mm -hmm. um, and I wondered if you'd talk about how homelessness and the poorest of the poor fit together. Thank you. So it's, it's ubiquitous, right? I mean, homelessness and being precariously housed are, um, you know, the homeless shelter, the public library. Uh, it, we, we often refer to the pu public library as the living room of the $2 a day poor. You know, the plasma clinic is is the lifeblood of the two dollar day poor. But um, I think middle class people fail, to, who maybe have adult kids at home, like I do, uh, fail to realize what doubling up really means for poor people. So often, if you're doubling up, you're doubling up with somebody who's a renter. And that renter's landlord doesn't want more wear and tear on the apartment. Uh, you can get evicted because you've taken in another subfamily. Uh, tensions in the home can lead to uh, somebody calling the police and then a nuisance ordinance will be levied against that landlord and your host family will be out. Oftentimes parents have very little choice in which couch to double up on. Uh, you know, Jennifer Hernandez ends up with an uncle after repeated double ups who molests her daughter Caitlin, uh, leaving the, leading the family into another spell. Uh, um, in the office, actually, of a, of a local Goodwill because they don't have a family center. So um, you know, all of these families, except those who are A, homeowners, or B, uh, have a voucher. You know, the public housing is a little tricky because most public housing authorities have a minimum rent. And this, if you've got a zero income, uh, you're going to be at risk of not being able to make that minimum rent. If you've got to pay $100 a month and you don't have any money coming in, what are you going to do? You're going to sell your food stamps, and then your family's going to be hungry, and that's going to put you on a, on a whole other path. We certainly so see that in some of the work that I'm doing in public housing. But it's also true that we know that vouchers in public housing are the best solution for homelessness. Right. Particularly yeah, vouchers. That's right. and particularly yeah. vouchers. And, uh, and we know the converse, that when people lose their housing assistance, we've done a study, on, uh, looked at what happened to the moving to opportunity families who lost their assistance. 
they're really unstable afterwards. They're ending up in exactly the situations Kathy is describing, even sometimes when they actually earned their way off assistance for a while, but then right. they couldn't keep up with the housing payments. And I'll just say one last thing. I think that we have demonstrated as a country that we can house our veterans if properly resourced and do it well. I think that we should take that next level and try to house all of our families and have the resources there. And I think the, the, the impact of all the things we're talking about here will be much more, much more you know, elevated just because family is now stabilized. Hi, Vanessa Kruger with the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau. Um, you guys have talked a lot about getting money to flow in, um, but I haven't heard much about keeping money once you have it. Could you talk a little bit about savings products or credit products? Um, we, yeah, EITC was mentioned, and Treasury now has the MyRA product, so that's something, but um, any other policy recommendations for uh, the national? So. I mean, in, in our work, and I think I saw Ron Ashford around here somewhere, there's a, there's a great program um, that uh, Housing Authority is one called the Family Self-Sufficiency Program. And it's basically, you work with families, rent, so rent is based on income, income goes up, rent goes up. You work with families to raise their income, but instead of raising their rents, you tuck that extra money away from them and, it, and put it in escrow so they can now use it towards um, you know, a down payment on a home or college education for their kids. So from a housing authority perspective, that is the number one tool that we have. But I know that there are other, um, uh, 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 other products that are very available. Yeah, and so K Kathy talked about this event that starts a downward spiral. And if you just had enough money to buy gas, you could have kept the job. So savings is the insulation against some of these downward spirals. But encouraging someone who is very low income to save is a challenge. Um, it's not an area in which I'm expertise. I have much expertise. But our ownership and opportunity agenda here at Urban and my colleagues, Caroline Radcliffe and Signa Mary McCarran, have written extensively on things like IDAs uh, and savings accounts for low income. Mm -hmm. They've demonstrated that low income families can save and that this level of save, that even that meager level of savings that they do achieve does insulate against events that trigger the downward spirals that we've seen. Yeah, I, I wrote a, uh, uh, with three colleagues, I wrote a, another book within the last year on the EITC. I don't know how that happened, <laughs> but um, it's uh, coming out of that research where we followed EITC recipients until they had spent, you know, for, for six months and looked at their budgets in gory detail. Uh, we have, uh, we, we learn that people think of the EHC as savings. Uh, they aspire to save their EHC, and they do manage to save uh, fifth, about 17% of their EITC, at least initially. Uh, much of that then deployed for the rainy days that's so inevitably come. And we have a, a policy proposal uh, out right now. Uh, 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 Cory Booker is sponsoring it. It's called the Rainy Day EITC. It's a it's a tweak on the EITC that allows you to save. We'd like to have savings with a match. Uh, we might not be able to get a Republican sponsor if we do it that way. So we're willing to, to, cons to, um, uh, to advise that we try it without a match. Uh, but if we can allow families to defer some of their EITC for a rainy day, uh, we think that we can, we can help families do what they already want to do with their EITC, and that is save it, but with enough flexibility that it can that it can be used to smooth income. Should we come back over to this side? Hi, I'm Matt Johnson uh, from Binghamton University. And I'm startled by the amount of uh, money that's from TANF that goes to purposes other than cash assistance. Can you talk a little bit about one of the high profile uses of that money, which was uh, for to teach the poor to value marriage and teach them marital and relationship education skills? Can you talk a little bit about that, please? Thank you. So I've been following that pretty closely. Um, and uh, it, it, these programs are expensive. Uh, they, overall, they haven't been shown to be effective, although there's some hints um, in at least one site uh, and among low-income married couples that you can strengthen uh, families and teach relationship skills in ways that keep dads living with their kids longer. So, um, you know, we've only tried these programs for a little while. 
Uh, we, we need to get the cost down. We probably, it's probably not a good idea, I think, to teach relationship skills uh, in isolation uh, without uh, attending to families' economic needs. And so I know some states are trying to sort of combine those services to see if you can get a greater impact. Uh, but yes, uh, you know, uh, t TANF dollars have gone to that purpose, and, and we haven't yet seen uh, a, a lot of fruit, but some hints that it could be effective, particularly in keeping dads living with their, their children longer. Right here. Hi, I'm Carmen Boston, and I'm a children's librarian with DC Public Library, um, doing programs and partnerships for the library system-wide. And my question is, all these programs are wonderful ideas and solutions, but where is the money coming from? I feel we have an electorate that goes for rallies around uh, candidates that say, I want to cut taxes. And I think um, one of the um, situations with the Affordable Care Act is some of the people who could give um, didn't want to give more to kind of make it work. So in light of um, you do have an electorate that what about me type of attitude, even though you s I agree with you, they're compassionate, but when it comes time to actually act, um, what are some of the solutions in, um, in addition to redirecting money? So, you know, if I... <laughs> <laughs> I'm a recovering economist. <laughs> uh, so, you know, I talked about 15 billion uh, into into TANF. Uh, if that money goes straight to benefits, there's a snap offset of about 30 percent. So now I need about 10.5 billion. I'm thinking about 10 billion more FEITC, so around 20 billion. And I'm not going to find 20 billion in the seat cushions on the couch. Um, but we have a four trillion, almost a four trillion dollar budget. So we're talking about a half a percentage point of the total budget. Whether that comes from other programs, whether that comes from revenue enhancement, closing tax loopholes, it's not going to be painless. But it's not extreme pain to find that level of resource. Uh, you know, it's more than a, a pinprick. It's more like a flu shot. Mm -hmm. But y you should really get a flu shot. <laughs> so I think it's doable. I think, you know, um, and I, I, know I have some of my homeless colleagues here in the audience with me, it costs me less to house a family than it costs you to shelter a homeless person. Mm -hmm. and, and, and I think that if you take that to economies of scale, you can really put more vouchers on the street if we very carefully collaborate, I mean, just calibrate um, that. And, and also, there are other ideas being kicked around about capping the mortgage interest uh, deduction um, cap and trying to find more creative ways to, to, to channel that money. So there's lots of ideas out there. So I think there, there are a couple of important themes for me that came out of that question and that answer. I mean, one is there is no costless solution right. uh, to these issues. Mm -hmm. um, I, I was asked a couple of decades ago, so tell me a solution to homelessness that doesn't cost anything. And, um, there, there is no costless solution. But um, prevention mm -hmm. uh, on a number of different dimensions uh, can be much more effective and more cost efficient than uh, grappling with the the sort of devastation of neglecting these issues. We know that in healthcare, and I think we've got lots yeah. of evidence of it here in this conversation today. The one other thing I would say, though, that I think is, is for all of us to think hard about is that as we've run through the intersecting challenges uh, and barriers that lead families to this desperate situation and that are the consequences of it, we have a tendency to start adding up the things we need to do. We need to work on work, we need to work on cash benefits, we need to work on housing, we need to work on health, mental health, mm -hmm. child care, early education. And too quickly, I'm afraid, we come to a, well, you have to do everything more at once. And that, it seems to me, is going to be a very hard case to make. Um, and so a challenge for all of us is to 
say, what are the two or three elements on that list that we've got to put at the top or move yeah. first or combine? Yeah. Uh, it's something that my own thinking is grappling with these days. I think we have time for maybe one or two more questions right there. So trying to actually pick up on what you just said, I'm Kathy Sykes from the Environmental Protection Agency. But I was curious about, um, you know, there's been a push on health impact assessments, that if we uh, actually paid people a livable wage, I mean, how many, would that be a threefer? Will we get more people in the workforce because people aren't working two jobs? Would they ha be able to take for their kids and not have to sell their food stamps? And then the second part of that has to do with the opportunity in the Affordable Care Act with having um, the IRS, you know, uh, the, the needs assessment where uh, hospitals to keep getting no taxes paid, uh, that they're actually contributing to the community and how we could address that or target that towards jobs and housing and also healthy housing. That would also add on if you're really sick and you keep coming back to the home, that's, that's really bad too. So. Or to say other than yes. <laughs> <laughs> other comment? Uh, right back here. Anna Echtalter, Historic German Historical Institute. Um, I have a question about markets, really types of markets, because um, I love the, the second when you st said, you know, they want to play by the rules, and you don't have to convince me about that. But um, the labor market, historically, I think, has never fed the whole population. Um, there's this black market thing going on that seems to do a lot of, you know, like, cushioning for these people. Um, then I want to ask about informal markets, because in Germany, that's where um, I know the numbers, you know, the young people, the old people, and a huge percentage of people who are just sick cannot work, and they're not um, su supplied or sustained by the market, they're sustained by family. So that's the third market, and I want to ask directly about the housing market. In Germany, it might be different here. Um, in Germany, it doesn't make any profit if you rent houses to poor people. So there is no way in Germany um, you make that a market. So, I don't know, I was just wondering, could, could you probably say something about um, failing markets? I can talk about the underground economy. So, uh, I spent much of my early career documenting um, sort of sub rosa survival strategies for people who lived on welfare, because even in the good old days of AFDC, it didn't pay you enough to survive. So, you know, it, it covered, on average, about three-fifths of your expenditures. It made it illegal for you to do any work without getting taxed for that work, but people then did work under the table. So uh, prior to welfare reform, there was a pretty vigorous underground economy. Our research with hundreds of welfare recipients across the country suggested that about half of people were working at any given time in some sort of underground job. And for that reason, we were quite optimistic uh, that if you reformed welfare, a lot of people would work because they were working already. And that is exactly what we saw, I think, in welfare reform, a lot of folks who were who were um, working informally began to work formally. And uh, this is, of course, good because they can get Social Security and they get the dignity from not having to criminal, you know, make their work criminal and having to lie to their caseworker and, and, all, you know, and putting themselves at risk. Feeling bad about it is a very big deal. Uh, so now um, we, we see that people who can work in the formal labor market uh, feel uh, compelled to do so because you get a tax refund, you know, and plus a refundable tax credit. When you walk out of the H and R block, you know, at the end of the year, as a worker who made who made eighteen thousand dollars, you get the fifty four hundred from the EIDC. You get the child tax credit. Um, you're walking out of there with six or seven thousand dollars, oftentimes, uh, in cash. That is a palpable reward. And it's one you feel good about because you earned it. So my own view is that a lot of what's going on in the underground economy now, uh, beyond the, the drug trade, are sort of these, these, these in, in the sex trade, are, are kind of small operations. Um, you know, a, a little uh, Alva Mae Hicks, Tabitha's mother, occasionally uh, goes to the local juke joint and, um, and sells, sells sex in exchange for cash. Tabitha herself exchanged uh, sex for food for a little while um, with a gym teacher who, uh, who um, uh, stalked her on, on Facebook. Uh, so you do s sort of see these small time um, 
activities, but, but outside of the, really the drug trade, and, and uh, I don't think we have the kind of underground economy, certainly, that you see in the developing world. And for that reason, our families really do need cash because there's not a barter economy here. Outside of the food stamp trade, uh, families have nothing to barter unless they want to sell their scant possessions uh, to a pawn shop. So I think we need to wrap up at this point. Um, at, do we have one last market failure point? To, to, uh, <laughs> Actually, I'd like to end this on a little more positive Excellent. note. Right. After that, <laughs> thank oh. you. So, <laughs> so I think that one of the things we are doing and some of the work we're doing with communities now is working with the kids as agents of change. We're not going to fix all the systems. We're not going to do all the wonderful things you all have suggested right away, as you said. But we can't do nothing while we wait for the systems to get better. And we have had the opportunity to work with kids and help them see themselves as agents of change in their communities, both here and in their households. And their households, both here in DC with the work we're doing around actual sexual health and safety. They've been helping to develop a curriculum. And in Portland, Oregon, where they're working with us on a food intervention. And it is incredibly powerful to see the kids and their energy and their ideas. Prius over here has been doing most of that work, and it's really exciting. And so I think. Yes, we need to invest in our youth because they're our future and they're our hope, and they're still hopeful and energetic despite all the awful things that have happened. That's right. <laughs> so please join me in thanking Kathy and this wonderful team. And thank you for being here.